Thank you. Uh, so, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, I wish you all are doing well. Uh, today we are going to talk about a very important subject actually in the seismic uh, exploration method, uh, which is a seismic data processing. Actually, we will spend uh, around an hour, so it's an overview. Uh, uh, seismic data processing is uh, a rich and wide subject in the seismic, and uh, we can uh, you can read books actually on seismic data processing. So I'll try to simplify as much as I can. Uh, I'll give you a quick introduction, uh, and then uh, I will give you uh, a, a talk about the definitions and principles. Uh, then I will identify to you the signal and noise, uh, followed by the seismic processing flow, either pre-stack, post-stack. I will talk about uh, we'll show you some real data examples actually uh, covering the most of the processing uh, uh, routines or processing steps that I will uh, uh, cover today. So as uh, you know from uh, my previous uh, literatures, uh, lectures is that the, uh, uh, the seismic method to apply seismic method separation, we uh, pass by these stages. Uh, these stages are uh, the seismic data acquisition and the seismic data processing and the seismic data interpretation. And today we are going to talk about uh, seismic data processing. We'll start with uh, some definitions and the principles. Uh, we will cover uh, why we perform seismic data processing, uh, what is a seismic trace, uh, we talked about this before, but I will add uh, some more information for you. Uh, this will be followed by the seismic processing basics, uh, uh, basics of seismic, uh, basic seismic processing functions, seismic domains, and we'll end this uh, part by the sorting and gathering domains. So why perform seismic data processing? The seismic data processing is the, the, the second step in seismic method exploration. And I, I just mentioned it in the middle between seismic acquisition and seismic interpretations. And it's responsible actually for increasing the signal to noise ratio. So it attempts to enhance the signal uh, and uh, diminish the noises. We will understand what are, what are, the, what are the differences between signal and noise uh, soon. Uh, so it has to uh, or it, it enhance the signal to noise ratio of the seismic section. Seismic section is the final product of the seismic uh, 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 processing uh, uh, or the seismic method as a whole, uh, and to remove some noises or decrease the noises and remove the artifacts that uh, has been uh, uh, recorded uh, with the signal. So the end result should be a more interpretable section. To understand what, what I mean by uh, a more interpretable section, so in seismic interpretation, we'll start from the conventional seismic interpretations. As, as, as you see here, you see uh, these are two different uh, 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 vertical seismic sections. Uh, and it had interpretation. So you have, you see different layers with different colors here, and you have faults. This is what we call the stratigraphic and the structural interpretations, or this is a conventional type, actually, of seismic uh, interpretation. Uh, we can also extract some seismic attributes to see, as, as you see in this uh, picture, on your right-hand side, uh, this is a, a, a sort of a channel in the subsurface, and this is extracted from the seismic uh, uh, volumes, uh, which is a reflectivity, as you see on this conventional seismic interpretation. Also, we can invert the seismic data and convert this seismic reflectivity into lithology and the flow distribution, as we mentioned before. And we, our next lecture uh, will cover more the advanced uh, seismic techniques. 
So what is the seismic trace? Uh, as I mentioned, we, we talk about this uh, twice actually in the, in, in, in the introduction and in seismic data acquisition, but I want to add to you and remind you with what is the seismic trace. So if I'm acquiring seismic data uh, with a split spread uh, uh, design as you, as you see, so I have the source in the middle and I have several receivers on both sides of, of the source, uh, this source, uh, the, the nearest uh, uh, receiver uh, distance, we call it the near offset, and the farthest receiver distance, we call it the far offset, and in, in this split spread, it is in both sides. Uh, so if I have this uh, geologic section in the subsurface, so I have, uh, as you see, four uh, different uh, uh, geologic units, uh, you can see the different velocities, B means the velocity of sound within this uh, uh, lithology. So you have different velocities and you have different thicknesses, actually, as you see. So as I have four uh, successive rock units, I will end up with three interfaces, interface A, B, and C. So let's see what happened when you acquire this data. So uh, I, the, for the first interface, I will have uh, re re I will receive reflections from it, as you see, like this in the red color. Uh, and from the second uh, reflector, you, we will receive uh, another reflection, and so on from the third one. And as this is split spread, you will have this recorded on the other uh, side from the source. Uh, after we record this, and we do, for example, the first processing step, we will end up with a seismic record as you see this is a seismic record uh, and you can see here you can notice here these are the three reflectors would be uh, uh, plotted like this and it has this sort of curvature or hyperbolic shape and that the, the, the trace that I use or, or, or the receiver that I pick here which is the third one from the source in both side you can find this will be plotted with this type of uh, traces, so we call this is a trace. So you know now that this trace represents the reflection uh, uh, for only one receiver. For the seismic trace. So uh, this is another uh, short record, uh, but this is, we call it the off end or uh, uh, end off, which is mainly of uh, marine recording. Uh, you can see here uh, the traces. So each trace on this is, was recorded in one of the receivers that you see this uh, blue uh, triangles, and the source was here on this side. Uh, this axis is a two-way time, and here you, you will find the source receiver offset or the channel numbers or the receiver numbers uh, 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 on uh, the x-axis. So this is in the field records. Field records means this is exactly as I uh, uh, record the data in the field. This is the geometry of the field recording. But after I finish the processing, I end up, as I just mentioned, with a seismic stack section. And this seismic section also have traces. It's built up of traces, trace beside traces, beside traces. But, but the trace here is generated after uh, the, the, the last step in the processing, which we call the stacking, and, for, and, and this stacking gave me this trace as if I record the trace on the field where the source and the receiver were on top of each other. We'll understand how this comes. Okay, but this is, this is called the trace if it is in the records or the field records or a trace in the seismic section itself. So what are the basics of seismic processing? So what are the basics of seismic processing? So we mentioned before that seismic processing is, is responsible, or, or the meaning was like this, is responsible for purifying seismic data from all noises, and noises are the unwanted energy. Okay, and increase the signal to noise ratio. Signal is the wanted energy. Which energy, what energy you are talking about is the sound energy. And which sound energy? The sound energy that we send from the surface, from the source 
of the rock, as we mentioned before. So, uh, 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 if, if you hear my sound now, and you have like a nearby other sound, you will hear both of them. But one of them, which is my sound, is uh, the signal to you, because you want to, to, to listen to that, and the other sound will be the noise. So, uh, uh, in seismic processing, uh, it is responsible for purifying the seismic data uh, to end up with more signals than noise. So, in seismic processing, uh, if we have like this, uh, uh, again, uh, geometry, let's really geometry, which would reflect more uh, a land seismic acquisition, uh, this data, as you know from the acquisition, will be recorded on magnetic tapes in with the field format, like if you remember SEGA, SIGB, SIGC, SIGD, or SIGD, okay, and, and from this, this tapes, uh, we'll, take, we'll take these tapes to the processing center, and at the processing center, these tapes will be read, which will, will be dumped like this, and uh, if you remember, this is a digital recording, so this, this digits represent the reflections, Okay, and then the software will change this by a, a processing step called demultiplexing, turn it back to the analog uh, uh, plotting or the traces as you see, this is the record. So we start from recording, we, we, in, we, from acquisition, we record the data on sort of media, which is mostly magnetic tips, and then we return back in the processing and uh, demultiplex processing software format. And after doing several steps in processing, we'll end up with vertical seismic section if we do 2D or a volume of data as you know from the acquisition if I'm acquiring 3D. So this is the basics. This is how, how the processing goes. So what I So, four main functions for the seismic data processing. We will talk uh, about each of them in details, but we'll uh, know them first. So, the first one is applying some editing and fundamental corrections and enhance the resolution in time. Uh, we try to enhance signal to noise ratio and enhance uh, of uh, the resolution of seismic data in space to so understand these functions. And we will go uh, for each one of them in details, but to understand that if this is the first record after, uh, uh, this is a field record just after one step in the processing, uh, if we try to edit, uh, to make editing on some corrections, we will apply a, a, a step called gain recovery. We'll talk about it in details. So this data is before the gain recovery. Here is, you find it after gain recovery. So before, before gain recovery, you can see the reflections clearly, but after we apply one step, which is one of the fundamental corrections, which is again recovery, we start to see some reflections in the data. Uh, this example uh, shows some corrections. Uh, one of the corrections we call the static correction. So if you see the data uh, within this red circle, you will find the lecture uh, has a sag or a sort of synclinal shape, but this is not true. But after corrections, this is how it looks. It, there is no any synclinal shape, but, but from where this comes, we'll understand when we talk on the step of static corrections. Also further to that, we'll have some enhancement in the resolution in time. You see that the reflectors now uh, appear more clearly. Uh, in which we apply a step called deconvolution. Uh, again, we will talk about this in more details. And then we try to enhance the signal to noise ratio. If you see this is part of the vertical seismic section, you see a lot of hushes. You, you can see some reflections, but they are not continuous. You cannot follow it across the whole section. But when we increase the signal to noise ratio, you see how clear is the section. Uh, 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 appear now. Uh, to enhance the, the data in the space, we use what we call the migration. So if we took a look on these sort of reflectors, 
you have four reflectors here and they they have what we call all time uh, we don't have this shape in geology so this is something related to uh, the, the seismic data acquisition it needs to be corrected when we correct this or enhance the data in space it looks like like this. so here it is a syncline it's a syncline geologic syncline okay it will appear uh, like these cotides in, in, in the uncorrected or in the time seismic plane. What, what we mean by domains? Um, to simplify uh, this domain, if, if you uh, uh, think about uh, water, so when we drink water, we drink water as a liquid, okay? But you can change the status of the water from liquid state into solid state by freezing and you have ice okay and you can change the water from liquid state into vapor state or gaseous state when you boil it and it converts into vapor so all are water okay but you can see you can find the water or convert the water from state to state this is state in, in, in seismic we call the domain so the seismic data, I can plot the seismic data or represent the seismic data in different domains. The famous one that I showed you the examples uh, about them. Uh, since the beginning, this is what we call time domain or TX domain. Why we call it like this? Because it is plotted against time. So it's called the time domain. So this is a time domain data which means that the data is represented in the time domain. The vertical section is the two-way time, and here the, the, horizontal, uh, uh, is, the horizontal axis will have either the receiver number or the offset or whatever, so the distance, the x. Okay, so this is what we call the time domain. This data, I can change it or plot it in a different domain. The most simple domain is the frequency domain. The frequency domain, which is, I, I, I give the sample F. So if I change this data into the frequency domain, it will be plotted in uh, either, in, uh, in both actually, the um, frequency amplitude, the frequency amplitude domain, or what we call frequency domain or amplitude uh, spectrum, and the phase spectrum. So we, it will be, presented in an amplitude spectrum, which is uh, this curve that you see here. Okay, this curve, you have the frequency in the x-axis and you have the amplitude in the y-axis. And this curve represents the amplitude and the frequency of this data. And the phase of the data also uh, can be plotted. And to understand what is this zero phase, zero phase means that the wavelet or the wave is symmetrical about its zero axis. So, this is the data. This is what you see here. In plots in curves are the data that you see it in the time domain. So, this domain we call it the frequency domain. How I can go to the frequency domain? A scientist called Fourier, he had the Fourier transform, so he can change the data from the time domain into the frequency domain with what we call 1D forward Fourier transform, you can do whatever processing you need and then convert the data back into the time domain using in the inverse Fourier transform. So this is, remember, a 1D Fourier transform or a 1D frequency domain. Another domain, which is also in the frequency, in this case, we convert the data into the frequency domain, but plotted the data into two different axes, which is not the frequency and amplitude. It is now the, the, the wave number and frequency. So wave number against the frequency, which we call it the FK domain. So, so, so the FK domain is a frequency domain, but we plot the data into, uh, into the FK uh, uh, graph as you see. The, the, the importance of this domain is that the data can be separated according to their depth. So if you take a look in this one on, on your left hand side, you see the reddish reflector here. It 
it is nearly horizontal. Because of that, it will be represented on the middle axis on the FK block. But you have another two reflectors that have different depths. One of them had a linear depth, which is the blue one, and it will be represented in this area as a line. But the hyperbolic green reflector will be represented with this triangle on this side of the FK block. So again, this is uh, we this is called 2D frequency domain, and in this case uh, also we use a Fourier transform, forward Fourier transform, and then when we finish processing, we return back to the inverse Fourier transform. So this is a real data example. You you see the records the record here, and you see this is the record. You see my cursor. And here is the uh, FK plot. So you see the, how the data distributed in the two different directions. So the data in the FK domain, which is one of the very, uh, uh, what, I, what I mean, effective uh, processing field, the data is created in this domain according to, to their depth. So going to another domain, which we call it the tau B domain. T is the slowness, which is 1 over velocity, and the tau is the, uh, uh, the intercept at the zero offset. And in tau, in tau B domain, we have two different uh, uh, conversions. One of them is linear, and the other we call the parabolic tau. In the linear tau B, if you have this cartoon of uh, 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 which contains three different reflectors, or three reflectors with different depths, uh, red, blue, and green, when you uh, 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 convert this data into the tau B, the linear tau B domain, it will be represented as, uh, we can say, points, as you see. So you, so you can separate the data according to their depth now by two different domains. One of them is the FK, if you remember, and the other one is the linear tau B. Also the parabolic tau B domain, uh, will uh, uh, discriminate the data according to their velocity. So if you have here, like, the reflectors, the blue reflectors, okay, and you have some red reflector, okay, blue is one of them. If I go to the parabolic tau B domain, I, will, I can separate the, the red reflectors will, will be plotted in uh, uh, some area, and the different than the Reflectors, so I can separate between both of them, and this is uh, a real data example. Okay. So these are the main domains that I want to tell you about. There are another meaning of the domain, or we mean uh, a, a type of domains which is, which is depending on the sorting of the traces. So I can sort the seismic traces in different gathers. I can gather the different. I can gather the traces in different domains, for example. So the, the, the data as acquired in the field, this is what we call the short domain data. This is the short domain data or the field record. So the field record of the short domain data is exactly has the same geometry of the acquisition. Okay, but I can sort this data. I can take, for example, uh, this is if I have an off end for, for, the, for the marine. I can, for example, take the common midpoint trace, if you remember the acquisition. So I can gather all the traces that comes from the same subsurface point into a gather. From where I get this gather, I collect that from the, the field record, so I can sort the field record into uh, CMB or CDB uh, gathers. Also, I can put the data into a common receiver, as you see, so I can take the traces. Uh, uh, it means that I collect all traces that recorded by the same receiver and put it together in an ensemble, as you see. This is what we call and this is what meant by sorting. So this is a common receiver. So the common source with which 
Gazer is a common source. Yes, it is a field record. How can I record the data in the field? Okay. So, and also I can gather all the near traces together, or all the far traces together. Of this gather has uh, uh, its own importance. For example, the, the field record, as we mentioned, or the short record, or the common source record, the three are the same, are ha how the data was acquired. So I can know where is the position of the source, where are the other traces. And some noises I can attack on this domain. But the CMD gather, for example, is the most important gather because this is our method. If you remember our acquisition technique, which is the CMD technique, okay? Uh, for example, the, the, the common receiver gather, we can attack certain type of noises, unwanted energy. For the, the, the near to this and far to this, I can check my geometry. Do I use the geometry right as I acquire the data or not? Uh, you can notice that, you can see that far to this, far to this means that you, the, 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 the reflection, the first reflection, or came times then the near traces. So again to go further, so all the data before uh, test tracking, which is uh, gathers, like field gathers, CMD gathers, common receiver gathers, uh, uh, whatever this is what we call the pre-stack gathers or pre-stack domain. And when I stack the data and want to apply some processing on the stack, we call this is a post stack domain. So the stack section, what you see on your right hand side, this is the final product of the processing. And at this section, only you can talk in geology. Okay? You can talk geology in this, in this uh, stage on. So let's understand what are noises and what what are the differences between signal and noise? So, generally speaking, signals are the wanted reflections, which is which comes from which are coming from the reflectors, the geology, which reflect geology. This is a signal. This is these are the wanted energies. Unwanted energy is anything other than that. Okay, so we'll, 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 we'll cover the noises, the type of noises, to see the difference between signal and noise. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the coherent and random noises. We'll give examples about the swell noise. Uh, we'll talk about the multiples. We'll talk about how noising affects testing. So if you take a look on this report, it's actually, actually one record, but it is uh, a mirror image of itself, and I put them beside each other. Please take a few seconds and try to figure out where are the signals and where are the noise. Okay, so if, if you take a look, you will find different dipping reflectors. Okay, so it's nearly flat reflectors, which has a high shape. These are the uh, uh, signal, the major reflectors. But you can have refractions in the... In the uh, shallowest part, you can see the air wave, for example, you can see the ground roll. So all of these are noises. We understand what means by each of them. Now I can get rid of each of them. So uh, this is how the noise looks and, and the data, or the signal versus noise. So understand what's coherent and random noise. To understand what you hear in the industry. So the coherent noise are, are those unwanted seismic energy that shows uh, uh, the, the same phase of the data. So it is found with the data itself. Okay, so it, it has it have consistent phase with that from trace to trace. So it, it, it is with you like the data. You can see it everywhere. For example, a type of noise uh, we call the ground roll, a type of uh, we call the multiples, which is one of the, the very dangerous type of noise, and the air wave. The other type of noises is random, and from its name, it doesn't have like a certain shape, or 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 uh, it's it's not in phase with the data, and it is simply can we can get rid of it 
by very simple processing steps. From where this random noise came? It came from the activities while we acquiring uh, the seismic data. So let's see some examples. So if you take a look on this record, this is a field record. Okay, you can see uh, ambient noise, some which is a random random noise. You can have electric current noise, as you see. You can see the ground roll, which is one of the coherent noise, and you can see the source generated noise. Okay, so wh what is the ground roll? Just to, because we, we we mentioned it several times, this is the surface waves. These are the surface waves that uh, uh, surface waves that, that do not penetrate the ears. If you remember, we have two types of waves, the body waves and the surface waves. So this is the surface waves that propagate on the sufficient boundary so it doesn't have geological information. Okay, so they, this is how the, the, the noise slopes in the data. Let's, let's take one by one and understand more how, how this noise is. Let's see it on the step. You see this is step. Yes, you see some reflectors. This is a vertical. See some, some reflectors, but they are not clear. After processing, when
So let's see this example to understand how processing uh, uh, increases signal to noise ratio or remove the noise by, by any sort. If you take a look on this part of a marine seismic field record, can you recognize signal from noises now? Yes, some of you noticed that. So this is after the processing. Now you know that what the, are the difference between signal and the noise. You want to see what I'm removed from this? This is all the noises. So if you add this one, the noises, the difference flow to the, the data after cleaning or after processing, you will, will come up with that. So this is how we get rid of the noises uh, or how the noise blocks and how we remove or get rid of noise. So if we, if we try, I will see this now on. So if we, if we try, I will see this now on, on the field record. Let's see it on the stack. You see this stack? Yes, you see some reflectors. This is a vertical section. You see some, some reflectors, but they are not clear. After processing, when we increase the signal to noise ratio, this is how the section looks like. Okay, it's much clearer. You can follow up the reflectors very clearly. So, Let's go to the seismic processing flow. We, are, we will understand what are the basic seismic data processing flow and how we build this processing flow and test the parameters. So these are uh, some uh, processing uh, uh, routines, the names of some processing steps or routines. So we load the data from the field on magnetic tips, yes, and then we reformat this data to the processing software format, and this is this is step called demultiplexing. Okay, and then we will put the geometry. What are what is the geometry? The geometry is I, I, as I as we mentioned, this is a split spread, this is an off end. We have to know the x, y, if you remember from the last lecture, the the, the navigation parameters. The x, y for each receiver, the x, y for each source, what are the offsets, the distance, and so on. These are all the geometry. And it is critical and very important. And then we do a step called editing and a step called demuting. We will we, see all of these now. To do the geometry, as I just mentioned, you have to know the navigation from the, the field. Then we have some sort of processing steps like amplitude correction, frequency filter, uh, deconvolution, CMP sorting. I think we mentioned something about this when we talk about uh, 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 the functions of the processing. You remember? Okay. And then uh, we could talk about velocity analysis and normal without correction. Uh, this is followed by stacking, which gives me the stack section, migration, and post-stack processing. I can output data uh, from here to this or whatever media, I can print and see the sections, or after the post processing. These steps, we call it in the industry, we call the pre-processing steps. These steps, from the very beginning up to the normal word correction, we call it pre-step uh, processing. And after the step, these, these steps, we run the processing in the short domain, and after that, and this is in the CMB domain, so you, you see the, you know, the, the name, the name convention that we use. So we have pre-processing, pre and then pre-processing, you have some of the, the processing steps applied in the short domain, okay? And you have the pre-stack processing, in which you can apply the processing on short domain or CMP domain, and then you have the post-stack uh, processing. We will talk about nearly each step of, the, of this in the real data examples to understand what we are doing. Uh, so how I, how, how I choose these steps? So I, I, I'd like to, to pay your attention to that there is no standard processing flow, you know. So I, I myself can process the data today 
with a certain processing flow. And after several days, when I take a look again and try to identify the noises and signal, I may add or uh, remove some of the processing steps. So how we choose uh, uh, the parameters for the processing steps? We use uh, uh, the testing. So for example, if I have the raw data, I have the, the tape or disk that has the field data. I, I, this is what we call the raw data. And then I start to apply a processing step. In this processing step, I put different parameters. We will understand this in uh, the, the examples. So suppose that I use four different parameters for this, and I, I did find that the parameter number three is the, is the, the optimum one that gives me the geological solution for, for the right seismic difference. So I will put this parameter three and go to the next step and run some other tests for changing the parameters and choose the best of them of the optimum and then finish with my data and out my data and type it to, or store it to tape or test. For example, if, if you see this is a part of the se a seismic section, if you take a look on the, 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 the red circle and you have a reflector in the, ye the yellow dash reflector, you will find also a synclinal shape which we call the set. Okay, so we have a set here. But if you take a look on the shallowest part of this section, you will find a shape of a synclinal shape. This is a shape of a channel. This is a channel on the surface, and the channel on the surface is full of mud, which has a very slow velocity uh, compared to the, the surrounding rocks, which, because of that, this reflector came later in time than uh, the others or the surrounding. Okay? So after, at, at the first test and, and parameter, we correct it. So now it, 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 it appears straight, uh, but you still have bad data on the deeper part. So after that, in another step, you can improve the data in the deeper part and so on. So each one or each problem you see, or each type of noise you see, you can change what I mean, or attack with, with certain processing uh, uh, step with different parameters you have to test. So let's end our uh, uh, session with a real data example to understand what we are talking about uh, uh, now. So we'll give examples of the demultiplexing, the trace editing, trace muting, the geometry, the static corrections, amplitude corrections, frequency filtering, deconvolution, spatial filtering, uh, the multiple attenuation, the normal bot correction, and the seismic data mileage. So the Multiplexing, as I mentioned several times today, is changing the data from the field uh, digital format into the processing software format. So again, if you remember this picture, these are the, the tapes uh, that uh, contain the reflections that or the acquisition of the data we have we acquired or recorded in the field. Different types. Of Part of them are very old media and part of them are recent. Then we, if we dump what's written on this, which is the format, you will find it is numbers sorted by certain uh, shape, which are the uh, feed format. We, uh, in the demultiplexing, convert this back into the sort of waves or the analog, if you remember. Okay, and it gave me the sort of field record as, as you see here. So now let, 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 let you check yourself what, what you see. What, what, what record is this? What is the geometry of this record? How this record were acquired in the field? Does it off end or split spread? Where is the source position? Where are the, the different receivers? So this is a split spread single record. Okay, the source was here in the middle. Okay, so this is mostly land acquisition. Okay, mostly. So now I have the data. I plotted in which domain this is this. Which domain is this? Yes, this is the TX domain or the time domain. So now I reformat or demultiplex the data and plot it in the time domain. Why? To see the, the, the difference 
or to identify where are the noises and where are the signals to do the sort of corrections and enhance my data. Going for trace editing, if you take a look on this record here, please take a look on the traces. Have you find any code trace? This is generally good. Actually, there is one or two bad traces. But, but to, for you to, 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 to know how to differentiate between bad and good traces, please, please take a look on this part of the record that have zoomed uh, on it. So, good trace is a trace that has reflections at different times. But bad trace is any other trace that contains whatever, spikes, whatever, a different shape than the, the other trees. So this is what we call bad traces. And so editing, trace editing, is to remove the bad traces from the data. We can do this, what I mean, manually. So you can go and click by your mouse on the bad trace and apply the editing, we call interactive processing, or we can use that using the, the, the uh, software itself, the processing uh, software. So on this part of seismic record, have you recognized where are the bad traces and where are the good traces? Yes, these are the bad traces. So what is the, or what does the trace editing routine uh, uh, remove, how, how it removes this bad trace? Very simply, it multiplied by zero during its amplitude. So when you apply the editing, you will end up with traces, empty traces that don't have any of the reflection. So simply like this. So you can do this again interactively by your, you see you recognize by your eye and, and edit the data, or we can use automatic editing in which we identify to the software uh, uh, amplitude three shows. So we see, we, we, may, we, we, we ask the software, if you find the amplitude very high than this threshold or very low than this threshold, please multiply this trace by this. The next step is the trace muting. And in trace muting, we, we just, if you take a look on this sort of data, do you, you know where the part that contains the reflections and where the part that doesn't? doesn't? Yes, if we go like this, we want, this means that we want to remove this part. This is what we call the mute. So we digitize a line on, uh, uh, on the top of the reflector, the shallowest reflection, and ask the software to remove all above it. If I remove all of the above it, we call it top mute. If we remove all fluid, we call it bottom mute, and so on. We'll see another part. So, and this is, how the, the record looks after mute the data. So in this mute, in this mute, in this mute example, we remove, it's called the top mute, we remove the shallow noises. We just cut it. Okay, we cut it, we multiply it by zero again, like the edit, but this is in, on an area. Okay, so if you, you see this sort of record, can you recognize where are the, the noises and where are the segments? Yes, so the shallow part, we need to remove the shallow part because these are refraction. If you remember the, the, the noise record that I showed you, we want to remove this refraction and, 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 and direct arrivals because they, they don't have geological information. And also you have this sort of part. You want to remove this. So this is after muting, after processing, and we call this one above the red line, the top mute, and the other one we call it the surgical mute because I surge or I cut part from inside the data itself. So this is how the mute work very simply. In the geometry, very simply, you have to, you have to collect from navigation all uh, all uh, the, the information like again the x y the elevation the distance from the source and all of these were written in sheets or digitally, as we mentioned before, and we, if, if I zoom on this, you will see that the trace number uh, so, its offset is whatever, the x offset is so, the azimuth was 
so and so and so. These are the navigations that we use, and the geometry is very important to be able to sort the data in different domains. So to sort the data in different domains, you should have the correct geometry. And the most important sort is the CMD learning, if you will. Then we'll come to type of correction, which is called the static corrections. And static corrections, we apply the static corrections for one or the four reasons that I will mention. If I have difference in elevations between the receivers, if I have withering layer, you know that the rocks and wind is exposed to the surface, it, uh, it withered. So uh, I uh, uh, so we have we'll have a withering layer, and this withering layer has thickness and also has uh, a velocity affecting the velocity of the sound waves within this layer. So to have different, so I apply static corrections to compensate for difference in elevations. For the weathering layer thickness, weathering layer velocity, and refer all my data to a datum or a datum, as you see here. So as if I acquire the data below all of these elevations, and all of them are referred to uh, datum. We have a lot to talk about static corrections. There are books for static corrections, but I'd like to show you really to understand it well. So if I have these two sections, they are two different sections, one in, in color, uh, scale, and one in black and white. You, you see the arrows, the, 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 the yellow arrows. So you have a sort of fold here, but it is intersected by faults. It could be false, so it could be faulted. And if you take a look on this black and white section, and you see these two reflectors, the, dark, the darker reflectors, you will find them dis dissected. So I, I, so I should have faults here. This is what affecting my data. No, this is not the reality. This data does not have the static corrections applied to it. But when I apply static corrections, this is what you end up with. If you, you go to this black and white section, you see the reflectors, how continuous the reflectors. There is no fault at all. And if you go to this, section, you see that the fold is continuous. It is not affected by faults anymore. So if I if I, I don't do the right processing, I may end up with a fake subsurface uh, structure. Okay? So this is how the static correction. So let's talk about some amplitude correction. The amplitude is how the data appears. The reflections appears to me when I plot it in the time -time. So if you take a look on this record, you'll find it black, dark black at the, 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 the early time up there, but you can't recognize any reflections in the down uh, or, or the later time. When we do as a, a, a game correction, we redistribute the data. We know why the, the, the energy decays, what are the reasons for the energy to be decayed away from the source. There are different reasons. Uh, we call one of them spherical divergence, uh, intrinsic attenuation. I have several things, but we I, I, here I'd like you to understand what, what you see. You see the effect, and we can, in more details in the processing, we can talk uh, a very long uh, lectures. So here, the, the, the reflectors appear. We do corrections here. Any step, I call it correction, is a processing flow, so it is mandatory to apply mandatory to apply. Any step called correction, it is a mandatory to be applied in the processing process. This is the game correction, or sometimes you, you hear it, there's a spherical divergent correction. We have another uh, amplitude uh, correction, so called the automatic game control, and, but automatic game control is artificial. I, I calculate the amplitude differences from the data itself. So if you have this sort of uh, of end record of marine record, you see that the reflectors are darker on the, on the early at the early time and faint here. You can see any reflectors. When we use this HCC automatic gain control, you start to see reflectors here. You can change that. You can even improve that more. You can see it like this. You can see it like this. 
Here is the parameters when we talk. You, you remember that the parameters I took in the test. So here is uh, the different parameters are the window of calculating the correction amplitude. Okay, so uh, if I, uh, uh, the window is this, you will see you will end up with a very, very uh, hot appearance of the data. But you see that this shallow part, okay, again, which is not data, it's noises, also appear uh, strongly. How can you remove this? Yes, with the top unit. Okay, so let's talk of the frequency. So I, if I have this sort of records, I have four records inside each other here, and this selections. No, you see some lines, uh, what I mean, uh, cover the whole Convert this in the frequency domain, this is how the data looks. So you have part uh, with the reflection, you have part of the reflection appear here, and you have some noises are here, and this is well noises from the marine air position. So after you correct that, this is the, the, the frequency that I need, so I remove the other and return back to the time domain, or the TX domain, and this is how the data. Believe me or not, but but this is reality, this is real data. So, on, on your left hand side, this is how the data looks before processing, filtering, just filtering. And in your right hand side, this is how the data appear after filtering. Going through the deconvolution, which we, what, what we use the deconvolution, what are the function? Yes, it's enhancing the data in time. Okay, so we enhance the data in time. So, deconvolution, deconvolution uh, affecting on the data by sharpening the reflectors and removing the short bedded markings. Okay, so two, two functions for, for deconvolution. Uh, one of them we call the spiking deconvolution, which sharpens the reflectors, and the other one is a predicted deconvolution, which removes the short bedded multiples, which is type, yes, from the noise. So, if you take a look on this. Uh, seismic section, the seismic section looks uh, very good. We have a lot of reflectors, but how about the shallow part? Okay, if I apply the convolution, you see the results. Continuous reflectors, very sharp and clear appear at the, for, for, for my eyes, and also the shallow section much better. So you increase the signal to noise ratio. So going for uh, uh, the special, the, the, which is a linear noise attenuation, you, you remember the, the second domain, which is the SK domain. Yes, we have this data. You see uh, uh, the primers, or the reflectors here are mostly flat, and you have some linear noises. This linear noise, we attack it by the FK filter, so we convert the data by the forward wave transform into the frequency domain, plotted in the FK plot, and then it shows the data around the center, which is a flat. If you remember the example I showed you in that domain, this is how the record looks after the FK filter. You, you have more continuous filters, and the linear noise mostly, mostly, uh, it's a Going to the multi and I remember that we mentioned that deconvolution get rid of short period multiples, but we can use uh, parabolic tau B, for example, to remove the multiples. You recognize the uh, reflections here? Yes, you have a lot of reflections here. No, I'm sorry. Not all are reflectors. Some of them are rare reflectors and others are echo, which is called the long, the, 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 the multiple. So you see this is a water bottom, it's repeated several times. When you apply the multiple attenuation processing step, you remove most of these uh, reflectors. Don't worry, they, they are not reflectors. They are fake reflectors came from the echo, or this is what we call the uh, multiples. We go to the technique of our data, which is we gather the data into the CMB domain 
to gather them, to stack them. This is a technique, if you remember. And this is the geometry of the CMP. So if I have the CMP given like this, so I, I will end up with the reflectors that has this hyperbolic shape. And why I have this hyperbolic shape? Because the far traces receive the same reflector at later times than the near traces. So the, the job that I want to do now, I, I, I need to gather this data together because it's, it represents only one subsurface point. Okay, so how I can solve the four delay in time, which is delta t, with the distance, the offset. What tie between time and distance is the velocity. So I try to find out the best velocity that can correct this hyperbolic reflector to be flat. So using the velocity calculates the delta t. In other words, how I do this? I do this by velocity analysis, and this is what we call simplence. And here we pick the best velocity that uh, 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 correct this hyperbolic reflector into flat reflector because at the end I will stack them, which means that I will gather them into only one trace. And one trace beside one trace beside one trace give me the seismic stacks. So go to the last and most powerful uh, 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 tool in the processing, which is the seismic data migration. Again, seismic data migration, you have books, you have different types of, of, of migrations. You have time migration, you have depth migration, but we, can, we have different algorithms to the migration, like the Kirchhoff uh, uh, algorithms, we have the finite difference algorithm, we have the RTM, we have the pre stack depth migration, the post stack depth migration, a lot, lot of things. But what, what, what I'd like to, 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 to show you is what are the effects of the migration? How, how the migration enhance my seismic data? If you take a look on this seismic section, please concentrate on these parts. What you see here, you remember? At the very beginning of the lecture, you have, yes, these are the bow ties. The bow ties. Okay? It, it's like you tie something together. This, there is no uh, geologic feature uh, like this. Okay, so when I apply migration, you remember what are the reasons for that? Because of the, these are synclines. So when I correct the data, it gives me that correct subsurface. If I have like, you see, if, have you seen anything here? You have reflectors, what I mean, interfere with each other. But this is unmigrated section. It is processed. But unmigrated, we, we, we don't apply migration for this one. When we apply migration, this is how this reflector looks like. These are rail data. These are rail data. And so on. This is another example. You see how this anticline is white, but when you apply the migration, you find it smaller, what I mean, shrink, because this is the reality. Let's see more example. So if I have like salt, so you have salt down here, but you cannot see what I mean, it's worn perfectly. But after migration, you can locate it like this. One of the main factors for the migration is the velocity model we use. And you know that what I mean by velocity is the, the sound wave propagation velocity. So if I imagine how fast this the seismic waves or sound waves propagate through the subsurface, I can, what I mean, migrate the data very well. So you see how the, the velocity model looks. It looks like the structure, actually. Okay? So the, the, the migration is the most powerful tool, and we can apply this in the pre-stack domain, and you understand now what's pre-stack, or in the post-stack, I can apply time or depth or with different type of algorithms, okay? So, for example, if you see this section, you have very good section, actually, 
and we apply this type of vibration to this. You see this soul body here? But which one is better? Okay? Which one is better? So this was processing in 2010. This is a co processing in 2015. This is another processing on the, on the 18th. Okay, so we have a lot of uh, improvement, enhancing the data. So this is how the processing uh, affecting the data. With this slide, I conclude my conclude my presentation to you today. Uh, these are my contacts, and, and I would be happy to get to receive your question.